Hi everyone, I'm your host, Shawnee Davis. I'm a filmmaker, entrepreneur, conservationist, and impact investor. And welcome to our Future Nature podcast. We aim to empower you with the insights and knowledge to navigate the increasingly complex landscape of tomorrow. So brace yourselves as we go on an exhilarating podcast adventure and dive deep into what it truly means to be human in the 21st century. We'll explore the critical issues of climate change, artificial intelligence, biohacking and longevity, as well as other emerging threats to humanity. And we'll be interviewing the leading change makers, thought leaders and entrepreneurs from around the world. Welcome to Our Future Nature. Let's get on with today's episode. Today, I'm speaking to Andy Cornish. Andy's conservation experience spans over two decades. He has also launched his own consultancy, Cornerstone Ecology, to support conservation work in Hong Kong. And he's become a critical part of Hong Kong's conservation scene. He's here today to talk about his love of conservation and why sharks and rays are key to marine biodiversity. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Our Future Nature. And today, I'm very lucky to have a good friend of mine, Andy Cornish calling in from Hong Kong. Hey, Andy, great to be in touch again. How are you doing? Yeah, great to see you again, Sean. Um, yeah, not too bad. Weather's yeah. cooling in Hong Kong, getting into the nicest part of the season. So, yeah, looking good. Fantastic. So, Andy, the world has a fascination with sharks. We, we're, we're enthralled by them, but yet we don't seem very good at conserving them or keeping them in the oceans where they should be. Why is that? Yeah, well said. I think, you know, I've been working with sharks and human behavior is at the, the root of all the problems. So I think the fascination, uh, you know, is particularly acute the media side of things or, you know, any kind of, um, you know, attack or fatality, uh, certainly in a Western country, um, immediately becomes somehow major news. Um, but let's just, let's just, let's just play around with this a bit. So. Uh, which animal do you think kills the most people per year? Right. And we're going to take, we're going to take mosquitoes out of this. So mm. in case you're going from malaria. Yeah. I was going to say mosquitoes are the number one for sure. I think dogs come up pretty high in the killer human list, but not the, maybe not the, the largest bees. You know, you know, I, uh, I actually don't know to those, but I can tell you that. Uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, number one, it's actually snakes. 50,000 right. 50, to 100,000 are the estimates. Um, and think about when was the last time you saw anybody, um, you know, killed by a snake, making the front news. Uh, and sharks, about six people per year. Mm. So, you know, animals like uh, lions, crocodiles, or, you know, either hundreds or a thousand or so. Um, and so, you know, far, far greater, far, far greater numbers. But I think it's partly to do with the, the, the sort of inherent nature of the ocean that you can't, uh, see far into it. Um, even if you're a diver, you know, you can't see mm. down in the depths. Um, you know, and the, the ocean is full of what seems like us to be quite sort of alien creatures, whether, whether it's giant squid or, um, you know, sort of who knows what. So I think it's a sort of combination of those and the fact that they're a slightly sort of alien creature to us. Um, and it's obviously been amped up since Jaws. I mean, really Jaws, uh, I think has a, you know, has actually been quite widely acknowledged to have a, a had a very damaging, uh, impact on the reputation of sharks, um, and all the other sort of silly movies, um, that are still coming out to this day based on you know, sharks. It's quite unbelievable. Uh, when I went to see Top Gun the other day and it's a trailer about some ridiculous film I never heard of. So he's just compounded and compounded. Um, it's not, it's not based by, by fact. So I think it, it is that on the one hand, which means that they don't get as much conservation attention, perhaps from the public as they, as they might like. The other thing is that the, the main threat to them, which is overfishing, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very widespread practice that often happens in places where you can't see it. And the kinds of fishing that take sharks is most of the common kinds of, of fishing gear. So it's a very, it's sort of hard to see with your eyes. Um, you know, as a member of the public, um, but it's actually very difficult to sort of tackle as a conservation challenge because it is just so widespread and so ubiquitous. So 
for someone who doesn't know much about sharks, tell us why it's important to keep them in the oceans and why they're important to our marine ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you have to sort of uh, understand, well, well part, of the, part of the way to understand this is to, to understand that these animals existed prior to the dinosaurs. So sharks evolved around 400 million years ago. Wow. Um, they've outlived the dinosaurs. Rays, which are essentially flat sharks, that's a rays and skates, you know, sort of started about 50 million years ago. Um, so they've been around a long time. Uh, and almost all of the species are predatory, um, whether it's sharks or rays. Um, the number of species living today uh, is quite impressive. You know, about 500 and, 510 species of sharks, 650 species of rays, and got more than 1,100 species uh, combined. Uh, and so imagine they've been around for a long, long time. They've been uh, eating um, and sort of controlling populations of all kinds of weird and wonderful life forms in the ocean that don't exist anymore, um, including, you know, those, those species of dinosaurs that used to swim. Um, so they really, you know, and if, if you go back well, farther ago than a sort of 100 years ago, you know, if you went to any sort of tropical or temperate sea, so anything bar the really cold areas, there would be lots of sharks, um, and lots of variety of sharks. So they, while we don't understand the ecological role of all of them, they really have sort of shaped the ocean, um, you know, for millions of years, even prior to the species that, you know, you commonly see today if you go diving on a coral reef. I mean, they're much, much newer inhabitants. So they really have sort of shaped the oceans. Um, and if you remove them, um, they're going to be having all kinds of sort of adverse impacts in terms of the balance of the ocean. Um, in ways that we still barely understand. Our Future Nature is brought to you today by Authentic Gallery. Authentic Gallery makes buying and collecting stunning and impactful art easy with a high percentage of proceeds going towards our vetted partner charities. If you want to buy art and contribute to an impactful cause, well, check out Authentic Gallery. That's spelled A-W-E-T-H-E-N-T-I-C gallery.com. As a special treat to my listeners, you can use the discount code O-F-N-P-O-D. That's O-F-N-P-O-D to get a 10% discount off all of my limited edition prints. So check out Authentic Gallery and start browsing now. Thanks very much. On a scientific level, it's easy to understand, but why should, why should humans care? I mean, is it an ethical issue or is it a, this is going to lead to a sign, an ecosystem collapse if we don't do something about it? Like, how do we get across to the average person yes. who's driving to work and is trying to pay electricity bills this winter uh, and the mortgage and the school fees? How do we get across to that person that we have to do more to save these animals? Because sharks, as you say, they're in the deep unknown to most people. Yeah, they'll they'll never cut, get up close with one. So I think that that's the challenge here. How do we make people yes. care to it to therefore enhance our abilities to conserve them? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know probably the first place to start is you know pictures from the moon and from the space station back at Earth. All right, we are two thirds of our planet's surface is covered with water. We are a water dominated planet. All right, so the humans we are walking around on the, the smaller. Um, a bit of land, which is a small surface area. And, you know, the world is so interconnected these days. Um, you know, even if you don't eat fish or even if you don't eat by the coast, um, the ocean has an incredible ability to buffer carbon dioxide. For example, um, climate change is clearly uh, impacting, is going to impact everybody on the planet. Um, and some areas of the planet already, you know, this summer has been particularly sort of, that's been really in the spotlight. In all the fires in Europe, uh, we had the same in Australia a number of years ago. So it, without healthy sharks, we're not going to have healthy oceans. Um, that is going to have direct impacts likely for um, the kinds of food we eat. Um, and if you're in coastal communities, in, you know, anywhere from Indonesia to Ecuador to Mex Mexico um, to Western Africa, uh, you're likely eating sharks as part of your diet. Um, so if we, uh, if we lose them, um, we lose this sort of incredibly abundant, what was an incredibly abundant resource. Um, it's going to have all these sort of knock on impacts, um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and I think just to illustrate, um, you might think, well, okay, you know, sharks and climate change, this is pretty far fetched stuff, right? But really, really nice study that came out of Australia last year. Um, there's a place called Shark Bay where researchers have 
for quite a long time been studying the relationship between uh, tiger sharks, which are fairly common in that bay, uh, and sea turtles and the dugongs uh, they are feeding on. And what they've found mm -hmm. is that, um, and I'm going to simplify a bit here, is that if there's no tiger sharks around, the turtles and the dugongs will end up overgrazing the seagrass, right? There's an awful lot of seagrass in this. So they'll actually eat it right down to sort of the bare layer. Whereas if the tiger sharks are around, there's a the fear factor, right? Because tiger sharks will certainly prey on the sea turtle and the dugong if they get the chance. So that means that the sea turtles and the dugongs keep moving around much more, uh, and they overgraze the, uh, the seagrass much less. Um, which has a really big impact on the ability of seagrass to actually sequester carbon dioxide, right? Seagrasses are actually much more effective at sequestering carbon dioxide um, than rainforests typically. Um, so you remove the cheap, you know, if you remove all the tiger sharks, then the, you're going to get overgrazing uh, and the ability of that seagrass to sequester carbon is going to go down. So there's a really, that's a really, uh, I think, it's a sort of really illustrative study about how this, this kind of relationship can work. And of course, sharks also do have a beneficial effect on coral, which is, you know, under threat as well. Um, can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah. Again, look, you know, this, I think, you know, one of the, one of the sad things for me as a conservationist is, is that, you know, some of the data we desperately like, you know, on ecological roles of all these sharks is becoming more and more difficult to study because some of these species, the populations are just so low now, uh, we may have actually missed that opportunity. Um, but, you know, any diver that has dived on coral reefs, uh, almost anywhere in the world will know what a gray reef shark is. All right. Gray reef sharks are unbelievably endangered now. Um, but, uh, it's a really nice studies that have shown, uh, on coral atolls that, uh, and firstly, I need to explain that coral reefs, you know, despite their, the sort of luxury and the wealth of life on them is actually, they're actually in quite nutrient poor waters, right? They're just very effective at recycling the nutrients. So what they found was that the gray reef sharks will often go off the reef out into the blue, um, and will feed on other fish, things like squid and things like that out there. Then when they actually come back to the reef, uh, and they defecate on it, essentially what they're doing is they're bringing nutrients from the open ocean actually over on and sort of spreading it around the coral reef. Um, and that really is an extra sort of boost. Of nutrients, and they've gone through all the numbers of this and shown it is actually a significant um, source of nutrients um, to coral reefs. So, um, yeah, these things are really tightly interbound. So they have they have good tasting poo. Well, let's call it the nutritious anyway. I'm not going to comment. Nutritious, <laughs> beneficial poo. Yeah, no, no great I mean, reef sharks were available for the interview. <laughs> so for for those. Of, uh, of our listeners who haven't had the, I would say the great privilege and honor because it is to, to be able to go and scuba dive or to snorkel, um, and see sharks. It is, it is one of the most, uh, awe inspiring moments to see a tiger shark or even a gray reef shark. Um, and I was recently in the Philippines diving with the dugons, um, Aban, there's one dugong called Aban, who, uh, big guy, but he's the only dugong, as far as we know, in Asia, who's willing to just chill out and, you know, hang out with the divers. Uh, which makes me think like, if a shark came along, would Aban run or would he fight the shark? Like, have you ever seen a dugong shark interaction? I don't think I've ever seen one caught uh, on film, you know, and it's going to, it's going to depend to degree, to a degree on the relative size of the animals, right? You know, big dugong yeah. versus a small cat shark, uh, the cat shark's getting out of there. Yeah. Yeah. But you've been diving a lot and I know you have a special uh, affinity for thresher sharks, but do you, do you have a, a particular shark species that you love seeing? And have you, do you have any stories about encounters with sharks of a deadly nature? Well, I think the, the one that springs to mind is the oceanic white tip shark. So, uh, this is a species that is dangerous to man. Um, this used to be the most common species of the open ocean. So we're talking about far, far away from land. This is a truly what we would call a pelagic species. Um, you remember, um, 
uh, for On Bail with the, the story of the Contiki. Uh, mm. If you get that old book out and you look at the pictures, they had constant problems with oceanic white tips because, you know, they were fishing off the back of the, the balsa wood raft um, for fish to eat, and the sharks would be just taking these fish right off the hook. Um, and it was very frustrating, but it really illustrated just how many of those sharks there were um, at that time. Um, they've absolutely been decimated. So, you know, it's always difficult to picture how much, but the, the Western Central Pacific, which is the area sort of, you know, from Hong Kong, you know, all the way out past the, the central, past the central Pacific. It's a vast area that, um, covers about 20% of the planet's area. Uh, the stock assessment for the fisheries management organization that's supposed to manage that, uh, this was a couple of years ago, said that the population had gone down 95% and would probably go extinct. Just an incredible statement to actually read um, from a stock assessment. You know, and these are wide-ranging species. They were very common. You know, you go back only probably 20, 30 years ago, and people thought that it would be almost impossible for such a species to become extinct because they'd move around and they'd always have these sort of refuges. You know, if you want to dive with those in the Pacific, uh, the only places I know are Hawaii and the Cook Islands. Mm. Uh, I was fascinated enough pre, just pre pandemic actually to want to go and see them. Uh, and actually had to take, had to take myself to the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptian Red Sea, famous place called the Brothers Islands. Um, just quite incredible. I and mean, you just get the very, they're very small islands. Um, and as soon as we got there, we'd anchored up, you know, the, the captain saying there's oceanic white tits under the boat. Um, which, you know, you think, wow, okay, they're here already. <laughs> I was <laughs> expecting these were going to kind of about to find, but just incredible experience. And you can, I mean, for an underwater photographer like, like myself, and if you've never been with there, an absolute dream, because unlike most sharks, they will approach you. They're quite, they're quite inquisitive. Um, they get very interested when you're less than five meters from the surface, not so interested when you're down deep, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, they'll come up and you, they'll bump, bump your housing and bump it, bump one of them out and nibble up one of my strobes. Um, but unfortunately, it was a real awakening of, you know, you're right. Suddenly all the pieces came together. I could understand why this animal is so, it's critically endangered now globally. So the most common to now critically endangered, um, because they're so inquisitive. Um, mm. They were basically around the boats because, you know, sort of little scraps from food being prepared, being flushed out. Nobody, nobody was feeding them. Um, but they're looking for an easy meal. They're inquisitive. They come, they come right up to you. And some of them, even though this is a marine reserve, have hooks in the mouth, all right? And were trailing fishing line, uh, where people are obviously trying to be in cap catch them outside. So, you know, very easy animal to catch, um, their own sort of nature, which has served them so well. You know, for tens of millions of years or since first they first evolved, is now really um, acting against them. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation, and probably one that people don't often talk about. As you mentioned, they're very curious, so they'll come up to you, get cu caught in a net very easily um, if there's a fishing net or a trawling net coming through. So let, let's talk a little bit more about that. So. You mentioned a 95% reduction in the oceanic white tip. Let's talk a little bit more about why the other species, or in general, why they are disappearing. So there's obviously the shark's fin trade, but there's also yeah. the shark uh, and ray meat trade, which is less known about. Yes. Uh, by some estimates, it's valued at $2.6 billion. And... In a recent report, it was reported that Spain is one of the world's top exporters and Italy yeah. is one of the world's top importers. So yes. we've been talking about the, the, the illegal shark's fin trade or the shark's fin trade and the, the demand in Asia for quite a while. But now it's come to light of this, uh, you know, this trade for the shark's meat. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about why they're disappearing and then which of those two issues or both of them perhaps are, you know, what can we do about those two major issues? Yeah, look, thank, thanks for highlighting that. So, um, you know, despite the complexity of the numbers of species of sharks, the threats is actually quite straightforward. It's for most species, it's overfishing, overfishing, overfishing. All right. And we are not necessarily talking about fishing, um, 
you know, very deliberately targeting sharks, although that does happen in some places. Uh, it seems that most fishing is using the kinds of fishing gear. So you mentioned like a bottom trawl, um, also things like gill nets, so either just hanging stationary nets that are put on the seabed, or occasionally sort of mid-water, things like long lines, so a, you know, to line with, with either hundreds or thousands of hooks on it, are mainly targeting things like tuna. These are all common kinds of fishing gear that catch a variety of food fish that we like to eat, um, but they're also very good at catching sharks as well. Um, and fisheries managers often like to refer to sharks being caught in those gears as bycatch. But I think to most people, bycatch is sort of accidental, unintended, not wanted catch, right? Um, but really, in, certainly in most parts of Asia, there's no such thing as unwanted catch, you know, unless it's toxic. So it's a much more, much better description of the situation is that the fisherman goes out to a certain place, puts his fishing gear out. He knows that sharks and rays are likely to be caught in that fishing gear. Um, and that's great. They might not get so much money for them, but it's all part of the economic model. So the fisherman uh, is not going to be surprised any time that they catch a shark away. So the problem is that, you know, just saying, well, we should ban fishing for sharks. You now, if you understand what I just told you, that really means you have to ban that kind of fishing gear. Mm. All right. And these are, these are some of the cheapest fishing gears. They're actually very effective. They've been around for, you know, probably 50 to 100 years plus. Um, so, and if you ban that kind of fishing gear, well, how are you going to um, actually stop, you know, catch the other kinds of food? So, um, what is more realistic is having sort of protected areas where you can't use those kind of fishing gears. Uh, and I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, but then the question is, yeah, okay, where's, where's the demand coming from? So, the fisherman goes out there, he knows he's got sharp, um, what's the market? Uh, and exactly as you said, um, most people who have any idea about sharks will say that shark fin soup uh, is the sort of underlying cause. Um, and it's this demand in Asia uh, that's really got to be stopped and it's really bad and it's evil and things like that. Um, well, guess what? And that's exactly why we did that report, the one you quoted, um, because <clears throat> uh, we were aware of um, one or two previous studies uh, that actually showed that Firstly, that the demand, that the international trade in meat has gone up a lot since the mid-90s. Uh, and the international trade is only part of it, right? So uh, the number one catching nation, for example, for sharks, would you like to, like to take any kind of guess? Which country do you think might catch uh, the most sharks? It's an, it's, an, it's, an, it's an almost impossible ask, but just give I us any. be careful here. Oh, I don't, I don't, <laughs> think, I don't, I don't think so. Okay, well, let's just say China. Okay, so China has a one of the largest uh, offshore fishing fleets. Uh, so I think that's a reasonable, uh, that's a reasonable guess. Mm. Uh, it's actually Indonesia. Right, has been for a long time. Um, you know, Indonesia has all these amazing, diverse habitats, lots of remote areas, and vast, vast area of sea. Um, and number two is interesting is actually Spain. All right, very different. This is not the Spanish fleet fishing around Spain. This is a large offshore fleet that travels around the world into the Atlantic, into the Pacific, into the Indian Ocean, um, fishing primarily for tuna. What you don't see, like if you look at the tables of uh, trade in international meat, you don't see Indonesia on there. And that's mm. because, of course, most of the sharks and rays caught in Indonesia are eaten in Indonesia, right? They're not mm. traded internationally. They'll be eaten at the villages where they're caught. Some of it will go into the cities. Um, whereas actually Spain, uh, which has this big industrial fleet, uh, is catching sort of more of the same species at the same size, things like the U shark. Um, and yeah, really interestingly, not many people, eat, particularly in Europe, surprisingly, don't know that uh, Spain and Italy have a long tradition um, of eating shark meat um, to a lesser extent, uh, France and Portugal as well. Uh, there's also another fascinating uh, trade flow uh, into Uruguay. Uh, and it seems to be shark meat that then gets processed and goes into Brazil. So actually, Brazil is one of the largest importers. Um, and then for your Asian listeners, there's another fascinating sway from Argentina to South Korea. Uh, and this is, this is, no, it's not sharks, it's rays. Um, have you ever heard of Greenland shark? Yes, buried, I have. Buried, buried in a beach, right? I, 
I never tried it. I don't know whether you have, right? But it's basically I, fermented I char. So uh, South Korea uh, has a very similar tradition, but it's not char, it's ray. So they get these rays and they basically ferment them in barrels. Uh, and it's the traditional dish called tongu, which I'm told sounds a bit like durian. You either love it or hate it. Uh, I well, did. I did. They did try to track it down the last time it was in Seoul, but um, didn't. I mean, I, I hate durian, so that's that's probably an indicator that I would hate this. <laughs> well, I'm, can you imagine? Some, I mean, you know, the shark that's been dead a couple of days it smells pretty strong anyway. So one that's been yeah. delivered from fermented, I think you'd think that uh, durian was uh, with music to your nose. So anyway, it's much more international. It's much less Asian focused, um, but it is. You know, definitely part of the the issue about why we have overfishing of sharks. Um, you were asking, asking sort of which is the which is the most prominent. We, we don't know. We just we just consider them to be equal. It's not. You could spend an awful lot of time trying to sort of dissect out which one's the bigger driver. It doesn't really matter to the fishermen as long as they can get some money from you know keeping that animal. Why wouldn't they? That's right. I mean, I've been to Indonesia many times. It's- you know, especially um, around Lombok, you see it quite a, you go down to the fishing market and you just see sharks being pulled up as if they were just fish. To them, they're fish, right? Yeah. They're not necessarily a special type of fish that we call sharks. I mean, to the, so I, I guess the argument would be, you know, can you, can you ethically say, well, you can't catch that fish because, you know, it's a shark. You have to, you know, even though you're feeding your family with it or feeding the village with it, you always run into that kind of problem with conservation, you know, that sort of idea of, are, are we, are we entitled to tell them that they cannot fish and how, so how do you bridge that when talking to these communities? Yeah, look, I think that, um, that, uh, that style of conservation really works for exactly the reasons that you sort of started alluding, alluding to. I mean, I think people, so you're more likely to talk about, well, um, you know, if you speak to older fishermen in, in many places, they will tell you that they have seen a decline, you know, in the numbers of species they've caught, um, you know, in the size of individuals. So, you know, once you have a recognition of a decline, then you're on common ground for a conversation about, well, how do we make sure that this resource just doesn't disappear? The species don't go extinct, um, and that you cannot use them anymore. So, and then you can maybe have a sensible conversation about, well, you know, are there nursery areas? So, for example, scalloped hammerhead shark uh, is quite a nice one because the adult females, and this used to happen in Hong Kong as well, almost certainly, the adult females will come in close to shore from the open ocean. They'll give birth to live young. So little hammerhead sharks, almost identical to the parents. Um, they themselves are quite vulnerable to being eaten by other sharks. So they, they tend to hang around mangroves um, and in very sort of shallow inshore waters, uh, which are actually quite easy to identify sort of as nursery areas. So. If we think about protecting those small animals while they're young, give them a, give them a greater chance of being able to, you know, get to reproductive size. Then I think uh, you have a, you have a grounds for a you know, conversation that wherever we'll be on the same page. Um, but you obviously need to make sure that if people's livelihoods are heavily dependent on catching those species, um, that they are uh, compensated in other ways. Which of course leads us to tourism. You know, dive tourism can be a big generator of income for a for a population or an area. Is it enough though to stop these communities from uh, you know, fishing for shark, or do you have to regulate and compensate them through you know government intervention and so forth? You know, uh, going back to this idea of you know you you can you can enforce laws, but at the end of the day, who's who's on the ground enforcing these laws? where they're being caught. And not just in Indonesia, but also for these global fishing fleets, as you say, the Spanish fishing fleet, who's regulating them and what they do? Yeah, well, let's, uh, that's, that's a much more tricky case. Let's, let's get on to that. I think that in answer to your first question, so tourism uh, for some species of shark and ray uh, in some places, I think is an excellent uh, way to actually generate income. Um, for livelihoods uh, as an alternative to fishing, because we don't really have many, alter- many alternatives to fishing. Uh, there is one issue that uh, I actually found out this first, firsthand sort of interviewing fishermen for a responsible shark and raid tourism guide we did a number of years ago. 
where the people who benefit most from tourism are often not the fishermen themselves. So the fishermen may get jobs as, for example, boat captains, um, but they might not have the, the language skills um, necessary to deal with foreign guests. They might not have the sort of hospitality um, sort of skills, you know, possibly to work in restaurants and hotels and other sort of associated businesses. So um, I think that's um, just saying, well, they can just go into tourism um, doesn't quite work. So you have to sort of look at the bigger picture, you know, and you have to understand what the community wants. You can't just go in there assuming the community wants something. You know, I think you really need to get in there and find out what their needs are. You know, and it might be something, it might be something that is not, you know, it might be something like a clinic. We have no clinic on the island. And then, mm. you know, you think about, well, is there a way that tourism can perhaps partially fund the clinic uh, that means that people's needs are being met, even if they're not directly employed by the tourism industry? I think those those sort of more holistic approaches are actually um, being much more, much more successful. I think the, and then how do we regulate, so going on to the second question, which is more about how do we regulate these super fleets? I mean, the Spanish, as you mentioned, have them. The Chinese, there was a lot of news about the Chinese fishing fleet in the, outside the Galapagos Islands last year. Yeah. Um, of course, Western media likes to talk about the Asian fishing fleets, but we sometimes don't talk about our own fishing fleets. You know, at the end of the day, how do we stop them from harvesting sharks without meaning to or meaning to? I don't, I don't know if it's deliberate or not. Like, what, what can be done? Yeah, look, so just to explain a little about how the, how the system has been set up. Um, uh, and unfortunately, as, as we'll get to realize, it's a, it's a fundamentally flawed system, but it, it is what we have at the moment. So, um, the, f the fisheries that take the most sharks, like the oceanic white tip, um, on the high seas are the ones that are take, targeting primarily tuna, um, and the billfish. So things like marlin and sailfish. So there are four regional management organizations, um, that are set up. So one in the Atlantic, all of the Atlantic. It's another one for all of the Indian Ocean. Um, and then two for the Pacific, because the Pacific is so big. There's one for the Western side and one for the Eastern side um, next to Latin America. So if you, uh, if you fish in that area, um, regardless of whether or not your, your home country is anywhere near there, then you can join, um, what's called a regional fisheries management organization. So that is the country that fish in that area. Uh, they get together, um, uh, once a year, uh, and they make, um, the decisions about how they are going to manage that fishery moving forward. So a country can put forward a suggestion. I think we should improve this. Um, and then the other countries will deliberate. Now, the reason why I say it's a flawed system is the way that it is set up is that it needs, uh, consensus from all of the countries for something to move forward. So only one country has to go, no, we don't agree with that. We don't support that. Um, and that measure never goes forward. And. I would say that these management organizations don't manage tuna very well because of that. Nobody, nobody wants to go home and say that we made a decision to cut the size of our fishing fleet, right? These are difficult conversations to have. Um, but the end result of this just going on decades and decades is that shark conservation is way, way behind where it needs to be. Um, there are, uh, in the Western Central Pacific, that massive area I mentioned, there isn't a single catch limit for any of the sharks that are caught out. Um, what has occasionally happened is that something like the oceanic white suit shark has got to such a bad level. Um, they missed their opportunity to put a catch limit in and try to make it sustainable. Um, and they put in what's called a sort of a ban on capture retention. Mm -hmm. So that means that if, uh, if you catch one, if it's alive, you have to throw it back. If it's dead, you have to throw it back. Um, but nobody checks you, um, unless you have an observer on board with a clipboard counting everything. Um, and for the long liners, for example, only 5% of the vessels, um, have somebody on board. So there's 95%, for example, of those long liners out there in the winter Pacific, central Pacific, um, with nobody watching what they're doing. So, um, the, the system is flawed. There are some discussions about kind of trying to change it. Um, but, um, that is essentially why we are seeing such massive declines, basically 70% decline in all the oceanic sharks. If you look across them, they're just doing very badly because of this consensus-based uh, decision-maker 
decision making where mm. you know you don't have to particularly justify why you just say no I don't agree. So we talked a little bit about the global shark meat trade. Can we just zero in a little bit more on the um shark fin trade? Because you're based in Hong Kong, and as we all know, yes. Hong Kong is one of the big translocation hubs for the legal and illegal sharks fin trade. Uh how, you know, through years of campaigning, I mean, I know you've been on the front line of campaigning there in Asia. Are the numbers coming down? Is there light at the end of the tunnel or is the situation still pretty bad? Uh, very definitely there's been there's been progress. Um, the various studies that have been done by WF others show that consumption of shark fin uh, has definitely gone down. Um, you know, in the 10 plus years that, you know, a number of organizations have been been sort of campaigning. I think the so that's good. Uh, and, but, but the, we did a, we did a survey a few years, a few years ago, and it showed that there was still quite a lot of passive consumption. So what do I mean by passive consumption? Uh, I don't mean that, um, people don't know that they're eating shark fin, but these are people who would not order shark fin by themselves. They know that there are some kind of issues with eating shark fin, but you know, when it comes to a family occasion or wedding, um, typically there'll be others in the family who do the ordering. Um, and if this person has ordered a uh, shark bin soup for you, then people will often eat it to avoid basically a difficult, awkward situation with that person who's trying to show you face, all right, um, and you're declining it. Um, the unfortunate people is you don't get off asked in advance. Um, otherwise it would be fairly easy to say, you know, thank you so much, but I don't really want it. So, uh, and it seems that 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 uh, that passive consumption is actually even larger um, than um, the numbers of people who you know really enjoy shark fin soup and can, you know order it for themselves all the time. So I think the shark fin consumption has gone down quite a lot, um, and actually the imports of shark fin into Hong Kong um, have gone down a lot as well. Um, given that. There is literally no sustainable shark fin um, in the world that's even vaguely traceable. So, you know, here we are, 2022, and it's all either unsustainable or untraceable. Um, it's still far too much, um, given the fact that, you know, and it's that the correlation between species becoming extinct uh, and consuming shark products like shark fin is clearer now than it ever is ever was before. In that the case of the oceanic whites of shark that I that I mentioned to you before. I mean, consuming shark fin is having real consequences out there, as is eating shark meat, um, and it is species starting to go extinct right here, right now. Do you get depressed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this has been um, the most challenging. It's the one that keeps me awake at night more than um, more than anything else. And so there was a big assessment of all the species of sharks and rays done in 2014. And that found, that was a landmark study that found like 25% of all the species were threatened with extinction. And that figure of 25% of all of the species is now uh, 37% threatened with extinction. But I think even worse than that is the numbers of species that are critically endangered, right? So these are literally, these are typically populations that have declined by more than 90%. Um, they are the ones that are one step away from going extinct in the wild. So in 2014, there were 25 species like that. There's now 92. 92 species. Um, and just literally in the last two years, some of the first species have been officially declared probably extinct. Um, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, you know, that, that they were they were fished out within the last two years. I mean, some of them are species that haven't been seen for decades, where people have really gone and looked for them and can't find them. Um, so, you know, the, the situation's deteriorating badly and it's, you know, it takes a massive conservation effort to try and think about, you know, how on earth do you stop 92 species of anything going extinct? Absolutely. So with these kinds of numbers in this critical situation, you know, what can the average person do to help? Well, I think, um, Firstly, be careful about what seafood you're eating. And I think uh, my number one piece of advice would be that um, do not eat tuna unless it's 
unless you're sure that it is, um, you know, sustainably sourced and has a good eco label. Because tuna is primarily caught with long lines um, that take a lot of sharks and are responsible um, for, you know, pretty much the 95% decline um, that we talked about earlier. So um, that these perceptions of sharks that we talked about earlier, um, if we can get that silliness out of the way and get people to realize that it really is this next decade um, where <clears throat> which is going to make the difference between whether we save all these species that have been around for so long um, and try to sort of recover and repopulate the ocean um, or we lose them. And, you know, a good example, just because I'm based in Hong Kong, I mean, you know, people in Hong Kong, every summer you get this ridiculous, oh, somebody saw a shark and, you know, everybody get out of the water. Like, God, we got the shark nets, right? Well, you know, we used to have gray reef sharks. We used to have scarlet hammerhead sharks. We used to have manta rays, all right? They're just locally extinct now. They've been extinct for decades because of overfishing. So this pattern of species disappearing from certain areas, um, and it's, it's sort of ironic to me that Hong Kong is not only ground zero for shark fin, it's also sort of ground zero for, if you want to imagine what a world without sharks is like, come to Hong Kong. Um, we lost all the big stuff decades ago, and it'd be very difficult for it to come back. Um, and if you told me that there was a sizable shark in the water, the first thing I'd do is be, ex grab my mask and get in with it, um, as I'm sure you would. Or I don't, that would be something to celebrate. Um, so I'm not sure if I would jump in Hong Kong Harbor for the shark, but yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe in Sai <laughs> Maybe not the harbor. Maybe somewhere where the water was, water was a bit clearer. Um, you know, we need more champions for sharks. Um, uh, you know, like, your, like yourself, uh, like this person I met the other day. Um, yeah, and if we can get more concern around sharks, more awareness around it, that will undoubtedly result in, uh, uh, in more action. Um, and then I think, obviously, avoid, you know, buying shark, shark teeth necklaces and things like that. I'm not sure that, that's some kind of things that people wouldn't necessarily do. But, you know, it's uh, shark liver oil capsules are commoner than you would think. Mm. Um, Squalene, which is the sort of high grade product that comes from shark liver oil, is, is quite often in cosmetics as well. Um, so that's right. Trying to educate yourself, trying to educate yourself around that. And, you know, look, if you really care, you know, try and get involved in a uh, in conservation organization. You know, we could always do more with all, uh, with more funding. That's well, so universal truth. Um, get involved. We need to, we, we need more people on the front lines. You talked a bit about there, uh, about we got to communicate more. Now, we, there are quite a few Instagrammers who go out and swim with the sharks and touch them. People like Ocean Ramsey, you're swimming with a, a great white shark. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think it's, it's a positive thing or do you think it gives the wrong idea of our relationship with sharks? I'm not on Instagram, I'm afraid. So I may have missed, I may have missed the best or the worst of this. Um, look, I think. We don't want to trivialize these animals, um, but if people are able to demonstrate in other ways that these are, you know, not just killing machines like they are portrayed and that they do have complex behaviors um, and that it is possible to interact with animals um, in a way that doesn't, doesn't um, you know, that sort of confounds the stereotypes, um, I think that can be helpful. You know, the most controversial aspect of it is, is it, is it okay to feed the animals? Uh, and I think ideally don't feed them because you will be starting to influence their behavior. But, you know, you would never be able to die with bull sharks, for example. Um, and it'd be very rarely see a tiger shark um, if there wasn't some kind of something to attract them into a certain place um, where you could reliably go and see them. And it's all about how it's done, right? I mean, you know, try, trying to make sure that you don't influence the animal's behavior behavior overly so maybe they're only fed on several days a week um and you know really trying to support the science support scientists actually having access to the animals and you know doing research that might not be possible in other places um and really educating people about the animals i mean i think there can be net positives out out of, out of that kind of uh, that kind of out of thing so you know i think Given that sharks are in such a bad way these days, you know, to a degree, they need to earn their keep. Um, you know, it's not possible these days just to say, well, we'll just leave you alone. They're out there and 
in the free, wonderful wilderness. Just go and do your, just go and do your thing. Those, those days are over. What happens in the next decade is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and you've only got to think about, you know, let's imagine you've got a population of a, of a hundred animals that's in a, a certain area. Um, you imagine that gets down to five animals. Um, you know, you just don't have viable populations anymore. And then you've got to start to think about, you know, you look to the terrestrial environment, you think, well, okay, if rhinoceroses were in that kind of state, well, maybe you'd go and collect them from other areas and try to bring them together. And it just gets 10 times more complicated. So the sooner, you know, why we can actually start with, with viable, the more viable populations, the better, it's going to be much, much easier. So absolutely the next 10 years. Um, otherwise, we're definitely going to start to see a whole sway of other species um, get down to levels that, you know, either can't be recovered or they just disappear. It's, it's quite a depressing prognosis, but yeah, the urgency is there. So thank you for all the, the work you're doing on that. A final question, you know, a slightly more of a technological solution here. There's been a lot of press recently about bringing the mammoths back or the Tasmanian uh, devil, you know, through genetic uh, splicing or um, reviving these extinct species. And I guess the reason why it's captured the public's imagination is because some people might see it as a, a panacea or a solution. Is it a solution to say, start cloning extinct species and bring them back? In your opinion, who knows? Who knows? Look, the technology is not there now, so we'd be very unwise to rely on it. Um, you've got some very obvious questions that would remain unanswered. I mean, you know, a lot of species learn from other individuals. Mm. So, you know, just because you have the DNA of the species and there's a physical specimen, that doesn't mean, for example, as a whale shark, will it know how to migrate? Well, of course it won't. Um, there's no opportunities for learned behavior. So, you know, uh, if, like I said, if, you know, if you think about trying to recover a, a population that's still viable at the moment, let's say 100 animals um, on a difficulty level of one, uh, and then you start to think about, you know, populations that are not viable and you're sort of trying to translocate individuals into an area and hoping they breed, let's say that's 100. I mean, you know, you talk about trying to, the difficulty then of trying to bring back animals from extinction through scraps of DNA. I mean, that's a difficulty level of 10,000 plus. You do not want to be going there um, as your as your solution. You'd be crazy to. Yeah, I agree. I think we're much better off trying to conserve what we have on this planet uh, rather than mixing mixing things up with nature and trying to be uh, tinkering with nature rather and messing it up. But anyway, Andy, I know you have to go. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on on the show and talking about the work and also for all the hard work that you've been doing over the years and uh, keep it up and hope we can do something to help the cause and keep the sharks alive. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. Good. Uh, enjoy, enjoy the chat. Yeah. Thanks so much. Cheers, Andy. Take care. Speak again soon. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Our Future Nature is also brought to you today by Authentic Journeys. Authentic Journeys brings together high-performing entrepreneurs, CEOs, leaders, and changemakers with ancient and modern modalities for intense personal growth to deeply align your individual and our collective purposes for positive change in the world. All of our trips are carbon offset and we only partner with companies that have sustainable practices and credentials. Let us take you on a journey that will enrich your mind, body and soul while helping the planet and local communities. Check out AuthenticJourneys.com. That's A-W-E-T-H-E-N-T-I-C Journeys.com to learn more about our upcoming wellness experiences, travel adventures, and retreats to help you find your all. Thank you for tuning in to Our Future Nature. Please remember to like and subscribe to keep up with the latest episodes. And if you enjoyed the podcast, it'd be really helpful if you could take a few minutes to leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Please also follow us on Instagram and threads at Our Future Nature Pod for behind the scenes and additional resources or on X at OFN underscore podcast. That's OFN underscore podcast. You can find our social media pages on the podcast episode description. You can also follow me at Shawnee Davis if you want to be updated on the work that I do in green entrepreneurship, advocacy, and conservation. And finally, Our Future Nature is powered by the team at Authentic Studio. Thanks, everyone, and see you next time.